Well, I think word must have got out that we have a special guest. We have uh, quite a number of people with us this morning. It's, I'm so happy to have you all with us and happy to have Mary Aubrey. Hello, everyone. Well, why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, so good morning. Uh, my name is Carl Skoogland. Uh, welcome to Treasure Hunt. Uh, I hope everybody is doing well uh, and enjoying the cicadas, at least in uh, this part of the country. <laughs> they seem to be quite vigorous in my neck of the woods at the moment. Um, so uh, we're here uh, to explore the teachings of Buddhism's early tradition, uh, in particular, uh, the discourses of the Buddha as they're uh, recorded in what's known as the Pali Canon. Uh, the goal of the class uh, is to understand as best as we can uh, what the Buddha and his early followers uh, taught us about how to lead a human life, and then to put those teachings, uh, those intentions, uh, into practice in our own lives, again, as best as we can. Uh, we have been exploring recently uh, the Samanyapala Sutta, uh, Samanyapala gets translated as the fruits of recluseship, also as the fruits of the contemplative life. Uh, most of us are familiar with the Eightfold Path as the standard version uh, of the path. Uh, but in this sutta, we find what you might think of as a variation of how the elements of the, of the practice can come together uh, to, form, to form a path. Now, the context for this teaching uh, is that a new king, uh, Ajatasattu, has just taken power. Uh, he's done that by killing his father. Uh, he's apparently pretty unsettled about this because at the beginning of the sutta, um, we have him uh, asking his ministers, uh, is there anyone who can bring peace to my mind? You know, and searching, uh, asking for teachers who might help him with that. Uh, his doctor, who happens to be uh, in attendance, he refers him, you might say, uh, to the Buddha, who happens to be staying in uh, the Mango Grove, uh, which is a park just outside of the city that they're staying in, Rajagaha. Now, Jatasattu goes to the Mango Grove, he finds the Buddha, and then he asks him about the fruits of his practice. You know, he's asking, asking what good does it do you, right? Now, this teaching, in this teaching, uh, the Buddha uh, provides a 13-part answer to that question. Uh, this morning, I'll quickly summarize the first five parts that we've, uh, that we've gone over already, uh, and then I'll provide a brief overview of the hindrances, which is the sixth part, sixth facet. Uh, but for the bulk of the class, uh, as I said, we're very lucky to have uh, another IMCW teacher with us, Mary Aubrey, uh, and she's going to talk about the jhanas. So we'll cover the sixth and seventh parts this morning, the hindrances and the jhanas. And as uh, a reminder, you might uh, find it helpful to follow along in the outline that I emailed uh, to the CML uh, group earlier in the week. Um, and as I review the first five facets, uh, it might help to keep in mind that each one helps us on its own. At the same time, they're leading us to something greater. They're leading us onward. Uh, so the first facet of this practice uh, that the Buddha described for the king was that one goes forth. One goes forth from home to homelessness. In the strict sense, this means becoming a monastic. And the fruit described by the Buddha was a fairly conventional form of social respect and material support that monastics received from the lay community at, at that time. But the greater characteristic of going forth, um, and I think it more aligns with the Buddha's own form of going forth, is that we radically redirect how we look for satisfaction in life. That is, we look inwardly to resolve our pains and we look inwardly for happiness. 
uh, it's a radical shift, uh, you know, away from looking uh, for answers in our external surroundings. The second facet uh, of the teaching was training ourselves uh, and becoming skilled in our ethical conduct. Uh, what Bhikkhu Bodhi uh, in his translation, in the translation that we're using, uh, he's, he calls it moral discipline. Uh, this part of the sutta, uh, if you've read it and been with us, you know, it's a great long list of, uh, of items, you might say, to keep track of. But at its root, I think, is the collection of underlying intentions that get outlined at the very beginning of this section on moral discipline, which is that we become, it says, conscientious, kind, and sympathetic for the welfare of all beings. Conscientious, kind, sympathetic. Now, in being conscientious, you might say that we maintain um, a heightened interest in doing the right thing, you know, the most helpful thing in any given moment. Uh, and being kind, we maintain and bring to bear a sense of goodwill as we move around in life. And in being sympathetic, uh, we clue into, you know, we care about what's happening for those around us. Now, if we keep in mind these three intentions, you know, uh, make them strong and consistent, then uh, the great long list of ethical goals, it, it kind of takes care of itself. And remember, too, that ethical conduct in, in the Buddhist tradition is described in terms of training. That is, it's a skill that we can get good at. Uh, that skill helps us and, by extension, helps those around us. The fruit of being ethically skilled, the Buddha tells the king, is that we see no danger anywhere and experience a blameless happiness. Now we can experience the fruits uh, of this in ways that might surprise us. Uh, for example, we might catch ourselves holding a grudge of some kind, um, you know, maybe harboring ill will towards someone in some way, or we can make a conscious decision uh, to shift to goodwill, to kindness and sympathy. This can take place in an instant and it's such a relief and it's something we can get good at. The third section, uh, the third facet gets translated as restraint of the faculties, sense faculties, which frankly, uh, you know, to be honest, doesn't sound real appealing at first. Um, but it's based on an assumption that's fundamental to the tradition, I think. Um, and that assumption is that experience is not something that's just happening. It's not just happening to us. We're not simply passive receivers of experience, not victims of experience. Instead, the assumption, the fact that we can confirm for ourselves is that we make the experience that we're having. This is a fundamental shift in per perception, you know, a fundamental shift in view. Now, based on that, the idea behind the restraint of the sense faculties or, or guarding the senses, as it's sometimes called, is that we become careful not to make attraction or revulsion with what we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, or think. You know, the six senses. Now, one very helpful uh, thing uh, I think uh, it's good to consider as part of this is that in the, in the teaching on dependent origination, uh, it points out that we really do not have what, you, what we might normally think of as raw sense experience. Uh, instead, uh, we carry within us uh, you know, a simmering stew of intentions, of perceptions, of ways of paying attention to things prior to us even coming in contact with something by way of eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. So these intentions, perceptions, ways of paying attention, they color, you know, they impact, they help determine 
our experience of things. Such that, you know, as, the, as it said, when a pickpocket sees a saint, he sees the saint's pockets. You know, and such that, uh, you know, when two people can uh, hear a political debate, while the words being heard are the same for each of the two people, right? Uh, they could very well be having two different experiences of those same words, right? Uh, we might become a pickpocket of sorts, you know, we pick out the words in the debate that fit our goals. The point is, is that we don't walk into an experience like a blank slate. You know, we come with baggage, we come with our own karma, we bring our own karma, you know, to any moments of, of sense contact. And then after uh, a moment of sense contact, uh, after a moment of sense contact, uh, the Honey Cake Sutta uh, further points out that we add mixtures of perceptions and feelings, uh, or sorry, perceptions and labels uh, to what we experience. You know, and based on those labels, we experience something as being attractive or irritating. Such that, you know, going back to the debate, you know, a politician in, in a debate that we're watching, we perceive and feel them to be, you know, either a threat or a savior, perhaps. <clears throat> then after that, the Honey Cake Sutta says that we start thinking, we start piling on, uh, you know, trains of thought, we create elaborate stories, you know, we concoct little bubbles of reality, you know, getting really agitated, you know, the common word today we use for this is getting triggered. Um, so that is a lot of theory, you know, that's that we find in the teaching in the in dependent origination and, and on this one suit to the honey cake. But it's really something that if you look for it, um, you can see it. You know, and in practice, this this uh, this set of theories that might make your head hurt can be streamlined into two simple questions. The first is, what did I bring to an experience? You know, reflect on that. And then second, what am I adding to an experience? What did I bring? What am I adding? <clears throat> now, the, the fourth section, the fourth practice, uh, in this, this teaching uh, is called mindfulness and clear comprehension. Uh, it's the same thing that we find in the section on the body in the Satipatthana Sutta. Um, you know, with this one, uh, we become mindful of our bodily activities and stay clearly aware of what we're doing as we're doing it. You know, whatever we're doing, we know we're doing it. <clears throat> This might be really different from what we normally do, which might be that we have the mind, you know, flow out of ourselves, you know, seeking, wandering, searching the external environment, you know, for things that we want or, or things that we perceive as a threat. Uh, the Buddha used an image of a monkey you know, swinging from branch to branch in, the, in, a, in a canopy of trees. But uh, in doing this practice, we compose the mind within the body. Uh, with the fifth section, um, the section on contentment, contentment, the Buddha, the Buddha is setting us up to require little uh, in the way of material necessities. Uh, this might require that we swim against uh, the stream that society creates, that society sets up for us. Uh, uh, the media, in particular, uh, society and media, they both encourage a sense of agitation, you know, a sense of, they both encourage a sense of lack. Uh, cultivating contentment, on the, on the other hand, helps us st step off what you might think of as the hamster wheel of, of chasing satisfaction by way of material uh, attainments. You know, cultivating contentment, it helps us to not be enchanted by all the dis the glittering displays we encounter, all the promises of satisfaction. 
in that uh, within this section of the Sutta, the Buddha says, just as a bird, wherever it goes, flies with its wings as its only burden. In the same way, a bhikkhu is content with robes to protect his body and alms food to sustain his belly. So these first five facets, uh, they're not mutually exclusive. And it's not that you, know, you check one box, leave it behind, and then move on to the other, uh, move on to the next. Um, instead, uh, they build on each other. They mirror and complement each other. They support each other. Uh, in practice, uh, you might try experimenting with setting one up as your primary theme of mindfulness. And then what I think you'll find is that the others will uh, automatically come into play as you experiment with one. Also, um, just to say all of these practices do involve mindfulness in that we bring them to mind and we keep them in mind, you know, moment to moment. And as is the approach with the path in general, the idea is to not look at, at these uh, these skills, uh, look at them through the lens of impermanence, just watching them arise and, and pass away. The idea instead is to cultivate them, to make them strong and reliable. Uh, they represent what might, what might be for us, uh, you know, radical forms of reframing, you know, how our hearts and minds interact with the world, you know, how we shape and sculpt our experience. These first five facets have benefits in and of themselves. Uh, they also put our hearts and minds in a position to explore the next two facets, uh, which are abandoning the hindrances and coming into the composed insightful states called the jhanas. Um, I think I'll provide a little fuller treatment of the hindrances uh, in, our, in our next class, uh, but for this morning, I think I'll give you just a brief summary of the hindrances, uh, a review for some of you, and then give the, the rest of the time over to Mary. Um, so if you think of the jhanas as uh, deep, calm water, then you might think of the hindrances as waves breaking on the beach. Uh, the waves that we have to negotiate and learn to swim past to get to those deeper, calmer waters. In short, um, the hindrances, and there are five, are sense desire, <clears throat> uh, and then revulsion or ill will. Third is torpor. Fourth is restlessness and worry. And then finally, doubt and confusion. Uh, the hindrances, uh, you know, they create heartache in general, uh, but in particular, they hinder concentration. They hinder peace and stability. Uh, staying with the beach analogy, uh, you know, sometimes these waves are intense and sometimes they are, are more mellow. And there might be one kind of, of these waves rolling up on our beach, or there may be multiple kinds, you know, multiple ways in which the waters are, are coming at us. In the early tradition, uh, the hindrances are not viewed as aspects of a self. You know, for example, longing is not part of a personality that, you know, we have to protect and maintain. Instead, uh, in the early tradition, longing is viewed as an activity that the mind engages in. Now, um, it is part of the path to take time to comprehend these activities, but we don't leave it at that. You know, we don't stay enmeshed in the hindrances. We don't stay enmeshed in our dukkha. Uh, you might remember that in the Satipatthana Sutta, uh, there's the part on the hindrances. And in that section, there are five types of inquiries that the teaching points out to us in regard to each of the five hindrances. Uh, 
first we can discern, we can be clear for ourselves, for example, whether anxiety is present. We can discern, we can be clear. Second, whether anxiety is not present. You know, third, we can discern how anxiety arise, arises, you know, comes about, um, how it is abandoned, and then finally, how anxiety can be kept in bay, kept at bay, you know, so that it doesn't bother us in the future. So this can uh, mean that we take time to more passively watch these habits, you know, that the mind has developed. Again, watching them as part of a greater goal of proactively negotiating our way around these hindrances, you know, not being pounded by them, you know, not being dragged under by these waves and drowned by them, you know, not being content with the harm that they do to us, you know, gross and subtle. So the sutta, uh, in the sutta, the Buddha ends. Uh, the section on the hindrances with this passage. Um, in quoting the, the passage, I'm going to adjust the pronouns. Um, and, and here's what the passage says. Uh, when she sees that these five hindrances have been abandoned within herself, gladness arises. When she is gladdened, rapture arises. When her mind is filled with rapture, her body becomes tranquil. Tranquil in body, she experiences happiness. Being happy, her mind becomes concentrated. Her mind becomes concentrated. And so with that, Mary, that is your cue. Again, we're so happy to have you with us. Well, Carl, it's wonderful to be with you all. Um, and I thank you for inviting me. Uh, yeah. So um, uh, just as a preface, um, Lee Brasington is the teacher who uh, I learned uh, the jhanas from. Um, but uh, before I found him, I fell into the first jhana um, after a, a, a particularly um, uh, concentrated retreat. I didn't know what a jhana was. Uh, this was about 2008, I think. Um, after the retreat was over, it was a seven-day retreat. Um, I fell into the first jhana the, ne the, the next morning after I got home in my living room <laughs> while I was uh, meditating uh, for the first time after getting home uh, from the retreat. My mind was still concentrated. And it freaked me out. I didn't know what it was. I had never heard of a jhana. Uh, jhanas uh, at that point weren't being taught in the Vipassana tradition uh, and um, very much, it, it, you know. And so I started asking people around about the experience, you know, nobody really knew what it was. And then finally I asked Hugh Byrne, um, and he said that he had been on a jhana retreat with Lee Brasington, and he suggested uh, that it might have been a jhana and that I go on retreat with Lee. So it took me about a year to, to do that. But in 2009, I attended my first jhana retreat with Lee Brasington. And um, he confirmed that indeed what I experienced was the first and maybe the second jhana when I told him what it had happened. And, um, and then I proceeded to sit with him, you know, several retreats over several years, um, gained mastery in them, and then uh, uh, now I teach them along with Lee. And I wanted to let you know that um, Lee and I co-teach re uh, jhana retreats together now. He also teaches them by himself. Uh, and if you get a chance to sit with him, I highly recommend it. He's a really good jhana teacher. We'll be co-teaching a, a jhana retreat at Southern Dharma's Retreat Center next fall. Uh, it'll be a 10-night jhana retreat. And then we'll also be teaching, co-teaching a two-week jhana retreat at Cloud Mountain Retreat Center out in Washington State uh, this coming March. So just go to 
either of those websites if you're interested, Cloud Mountain Retreat Center or Southern Dharma. Southern Dharma is in North Carolina. And Carl, thank you for that wonderful introduction um, to, uh, to this section of um, the second uh, discourse in, in the long discourses. Um, So the section that I'm gonna talk about today is uh, the section on the jhanas. Uh, there's uh, four main paragraphs that I'll talk about, uh, which are labeled the first jhana, the second jhana, the third jhana, and the fourth jhana. I'm also gonna to touch on a little bit on the paragraph that just follows that called insight knowledge. And uh, Carl may want to talk about it more in further classes, but I'm going to touch on it because really it's that paragraph that talks about the purpose for doing the jhanas. And so I think it's worth covering today. <clears throat> so I'm going to uh, spend however long it takes to, to go through these paragraphs. Um, and then I'll take questions. And then if we've got enough time left over, we'll have a short sit. So let's see how it goes. The first jhana. Quite secluded from sense pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, one enters and dwells in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought and filled with the rapture and happiness born of seclusion. One drenches, steeps, saturates, and suffuses one's body with this rapture and happiness born of seclusion, so that there is no part of one's entire body which is not suffused with this rapture and happiness. By the way, this is Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation, which you can get on suttacentral.net. Central, um, so just right off the bat, bat uh, it says, quite secluded from sense pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. So what we're talking about here is being secluded from the hindrances. Uh, the hindrances are no longer an issue. During the hindrance portion of your sitting, as they come up and go away and come back up, you have successfully dealt with them, not permanently, but temporarily. And this probably happens to you now, you know, when you either go on retreat or you sit for a long period of, uh, at home, you realize that as you sit, you know, sense desire may come up and it goes, it may come up and it goes. And then all of a sudden you're not with, you're without sense desire. The same with aversion or sloth and torpor or restlessness or doubt. You know, these things come and go as distractions, but, but after a while, the mind becomes quiet. And it's uh, that quiet mind that is necessary before you can uh, get into the jhanas, a, a, a mind secluded from the hindrances, if you will. And uh, we, there's a, a stage right before you get into the jhanas called access concentration. And access concentration is really just about uh, being uh, uh, focused on a method of meditation, coming back to it over and over and over. For a lot of people, it's the breath, but you can also use metta or you can use a body scan and there are other techniques too. Um, but during this pre-jhana stage of access concentration, uh, you just get your mind sing singularly focused on the object of your meditation and keep coming back. And then if hindrances come during that uh, pre-jhanic stage, uh, you deal with them and then keep coming back, keep coming back. Eventually the mind will get still. And then uh, when it does get still and the hindrances are in temporary abeyance, you'll enter into a room of your, of your mind <laughs> that we call access concentration. And it's sort of the, the uh, room next to the room that where you enter the jhanas. And it's a room that is very quiet. There's still thoughts, but they're wispy and in the background. And um, they're more about what's going on right now than they are about the past or the future. 
This is excess concentration. It's a concentrated state. It's not yet the altered state of consciousness that you experience in the jhanas, but it's a concentrated state. And it's a valuable state to experience. You're able to be with every breath, if breath is your method of gaining access. You're just not distracted that much. And the hindrances are long gone. So that is a preliminary step to getting into the jhanas. And it's really sort of, it's not mentioned in the suttas, but it's hinted at in the paragraph that Carl read. Um, it says, when one sees these five hindrances have been abandoned within oneself, gladness arises. When one is gladdened, rapture arises. So the gladdened is the gladness of being in access concentration. And then when rapture arises, that's the rapture of the first jhana. All right, so this uh, paragraph on the first jhana, uh, quite secluded from sense pleasure, secluded from unwholesome states, one enters and dwells in the first jhana, which is accompanied by a play, applied and sustained thought and filled with rapture and happiness born of seclusion. So applied and sustained thought, the Pali words are vitaka and vichara. In other words, your mind is thinking. It's still thinking uh, as it was in access concentration. But again, these thoughts are wispy. They're in the background. They're not a problem. And it's more about what's going on in the present moment than what uh, anything about the past or the future. Like, oh, um, I like this second jhana, this first jhana. This is pretty cool. And it's got this rapture, you know. Let me speak a bit about that rapture. It's got a thrill component to it, it, it a, a bodily component to it. Um, the first time I, I experienced the first jhana, again, I didn't know what it was. It was really strong. Um, and for a lot of people who experience it for the first time, it is strong. But then it subsides as you experience it later on. Um, but it's got a little agitation to it, not in a bad way necessarily, although for some people it's not pleasant, but mostly it's just a, a physical thrill, rapture, if you will. The poly word for it is PT, P-I-T-I. Um, and that is in the foreground of the first jhana. It's really strong, usually, uh, compared to the happiness uh, that's also present which is in the background. So you've got this uh, rapture in the foreground, this th physical thrill component in the foreground, and this emotional, uh, uh, more subdued happiness in the background. And that's the sukha, the Pali word for happiness, sukha. It's an emotional state. And those, those are the uh, two primary markers of the first jhana, piti in the foreground, this rapture, and sukha in the background, this happiness. In the second jhana, they're reversed. They're both present, but sukha is in the foreground in the second jhana, and piti is in the background. So the first jhana, though, going back to that, it says, one drenches, steeps, and saturates, suffuses one's body with this rapture and happiness born of seclusion from the hindrances. So the idea here is that this PT in the foreground, sukha in the background, saturates the body, suffuses the body with this, um, with this jhana so that there is no part of the entire body which is not suffused by this rapture and happiness. Well, that's an advanced practice of the first jhana. Uh, for a lot of people, when they first get into the jhanas, uh, they don't have this full body experience, this um, drenched, steeped, saturated, and suffusing of the body with this rapture and happiness. They feel it, but it's usually localized somewhere. And um, they, they ha don't have yet the full body experience of it. But when you get the full body experience of it, that is, um, that's the, the, you know, the, the successful experience of the first jhana. And there's ways to 
uh, create a full body experience that we teach on retreat by moving your attention on the PT Sukha throughout the body. All right, so there's a simile. Uh, great King. This is uh, the Buddha speaking to the, to the king, King Aja Tasatu, uh, who has come to the Buddha for advice um, on um, what kind of fruits there are for, uh, of, of uh, being on this path uh, to, the, to uh, being free from suffering. And um, the Buddha launches in now to this uh, explanation about uh, the suttas being uh, fruit of being on this path. And um, so he tells, the Buddha tells the king about uh, what it's like to be in the first jhana, at, you know, this, this fruit of being on the path. The Buddha says, great king, suppose a skilled bath attendant or uh, his apprentice were to pour soap powder or soap flakes into a metal basin, sprinkle it with water, knead it into a bowl, a ball, so that the ball of soap powder is pervaded by moisture, encompassed by moisture, suffused with moisture, inside and out, and yet would not trickle. In the same way, great king, the bhikkhu, the monk, a student, drenches, steep, saturates, and suffuses one's body with the rapture and happiness born of seclusion from the hindrances, so that there is no part of one's entire body not suffused by this rapture and happiness. P.T. Sukha. This great king is a visible fruit of recluseship, more excellent and sublime than the previous ones I've told you about. So uh, we've got... Uh, uh, a, um, a bath attendant, you know, in, in the Buddha's day, you couldn't just go down to Walgreens and buy a bar of soap. Uh, you had to create a ball of soap with, with uh, soap flakes and water. And, and you sprinkled in the water into the, the, snow, uh, the, <laughs> the soap flakes in just the right proportion to make uh, a congealed ball so that the bath attendant has a, a, a ball of soap now within, uh, with which to, to wash someone. And um, what this simile is telling us is uh, how a perfected first jhana, let's say, with, uh, that's suffused with this rapture and happiness is like. You know, it's just like um, uh, making a ball of soap with flakes and, and water uh, and, it can, and, it, and the water permeates the soap flakes, just like rapture and ha happiness permeate the body. Uh, yeah. Okay, that is the first jhana. Now, I know probably some of you have questions at this point, but I'm going to move on. But I'll give you time to answer at the end. This is the second jhana that the Buddha is telling the king about. Further great king, Ajatasattu, with the subsiding of applied and sustained thought, the bhikkhu enters and dwells in the second jhana, which is accompanied by internal confidence, some suttas say internal tranquility, uh, and unification of mind. And this jhana is without applied and sustained thought and is filled with the rapture and happiness born of concentration. One drenches, steep, saturates, and suffuses one's body with this rapture and happiness born of concentration, so that there's no part of the entire body which is not suffused by this rapture and happiness. Well, as I said a minute ago, in the second jhana, rapture and happiness are reversed. The mark of the second jhana is the happiness is in the foreground, and this, the, the piti, the, the rapture, is in the background. So it's a, it's a different experience. And, and this one, as you heard, is born of, of uh, concentration. It's the concentration of the first jhana that the second jhana is born from. Whereas in the first jhana, it said it was born of seclusion from the hindrances because it's born from uh, 
being secluded from the hindrances, not experience the hindrances, at least temporarily. So the second jhana is born from the concentration of the first jhana. And you still have a bit of that thrill, that physical thrill component of, of rapture in the background, but it's way subdued. And what's really prominent is, is the, the sukha, the happiness, the emotional state of happiness in the foreground. Now, what I wanna say about this experience of this happiness is that it is something that you have inside you. Um, these states have been identified uh, by spiritual seekers uh, for uh, centuries. And uh, people find them on their own. Uh, they don't necessarily need to be instructed. These states are in us. We just need to uncover them. And, and my point for saying that is, usually we consider happiness to be solely dependent on external events. Our happiness is, we think, is solely dependent on someone making us happy. And what you learn with the jhanas is that you can experience happiness, you know, pure happiness, without any external triggers needed. Um, my oldest son, Justin, died almost six years ago from cancer. Uh, and, you know, I was a, a meditator. I, I've been meditating now for about 30 years and practicing the jhanas for more, uh, by that time, maybe, you know, 10 years or something, I don't know. And um, so he, he died and of course I was heartbroken. Um, and I didn't meditate for a while after he died. I mostly read novels and just, but there came a time, you know, about six months after his death when I did start meditating again. And um, I started getting into the jhanas. Uh, and uh, I'll never forget that time sitting in my uh, home, um, getting into this second jhana for the first time after my son died and experiencing the sheer happiness of it. I thought I would never be happy again. And I mean, I just cried. Uh, experiencing the happiness of the second jhana uh, with tears of gratitude. Yeah. So we've got a simile for the second jhana. The Buddha again, talking to King Ajatasattu. Great king. Suppose there were a deep lake whose waters welled up from below. It would have no inlet for water from the east, west, north, or south, nor would it be refilled from time to time with showers of rain from above. Yet a current of cool water welling up from within the lake would drench, steep, saturate, and suffuse that whole lake so that there would be no part of that entire lake which is not suffused with the cool, cool water. In the same way, great king, a bhikkhu drenches deep, saturates and suffuses his, his, one's body with the rapture and happiness born of concentration so that there is no part of his entire body which is not suffused by this rapture and happiness. This too, great king, is a visible fruit of recluseship, of being on this path, more excellent and sublime than the previous ones. Well, this is a very accurate simile for what it's like to be in the second jhana. You know, first of all, it's, it, it doesn't depend on uh, inlets of water from anywhere else, these external triggers for happiness. It doesn't depend on rain above, you know, uh, external triggers for, for happiness. It's completely fed from within this, this well um, from within that saturates this, uh, this body of water, this deep lake with the cool water of happiness. It's, it's amazingly accurate. 
And again, a, a whole body experience of this sukha in the foreground and PT in the background uh, is, is uh, may not be experienced right when you first get into it, but it happens with practice. Okay, the third jhana. Further, great king, with the fading away of rapture, the bhikkhu dwells in equanimity, mindful and clearly comprehending, and experiences happiness with the body. Thus, one enters and dwells in the third jhana, of which the noble ones declare, <clears throat> one dwells happily with equanimity and mindfulness. One drenches, steeps, saturates, and suffuses one's body with this happiness free from rapture so that there is no part of one's entire body which is not suffused by this happiness. All right. So it starts off, further great king with the fading away of rapture. So the third jhana is marked by the absence of rapture. Of course, this rapture, this bodily thrill component of PT that's so present in the first jhana and to a lesser degree in the second is now completely gone in the third. If there's any rapture remaining, this physical thrill component, uh, then you, it means you haven't, you're not in the third jhana. So the rapture completely leaves, the fading away of rapture. One dwells in equanimity, uh, and mindfulness and uh, happiness or sukha. And these three are really what we call contentment. In other words, what you do with that sukha from the second jhana, that happiness from the second jhana, is you dial it down as you're in th the third jhana or, or transitioning to the third jhana. You dial that happiness down until it reaches contentment. Yeah, so it's got this mixture of equanimity and mindfulness and happiness. And there again, one is uh, steeped, saturated, and suffused with it when it becomes perfected. And this, this contentment um, is a wishless state. It's quite sublime. Um, it's, it's, it's complete satisfaction. You don't want for anything. And as you progress through these, um, John is the mind, of course, gets quieter and quieter. It's, uh, it's really a nice state. And they go from more gross to more subtle. So the first one is marked by that physical, physical thrill component of PT. It's a little, has a, um, if you're comparing gross with subtle, it's more gross. And uh, then happiness is a little more subtle. And now contentment is really subtle, but very present. The happiness has been dialed down. And there's a, you know, um, uh, there's a, a sense of uh, being isolated from the world now. I mean, you're really uh, just um, with your uh, experience. And there's a simile. Great king, Ajatasattu, the Buddha says, suppose in a lotus pond there were blue, white, or red lotuses that have been born in the water, grow up in the water, and never rise above the water, but they flourish immersed in the water. From their tips to their roots, they would be drenched, steeped, saturated, and suffused with cool water so that there would be no part of those lotuses not suffused with cool water. In the same way, great king, the bhikkhu drenches, steep, saturates, and suffuses his body with a happiness free from rapture, so that there is no part of his entire body which is not suffused by this happiness of the second jhana, this contentment. 
This too, great king, is a visible fruit of recluseship, of being on this path, more excellent and more sublime than the previous ones. So we've got a picture of a lotus pond here with this simile for the third jhana. It's a very still picture. These lotuses are underwater, completely, you know, isolated, kind of like the experience of being in the third jhana of contentment. Very still. The lotuses aren't above ground or above water, you know, subject to the winds uh, or rain. They're not waving around. The mind, the lotuses are very still submerged in this water, just like the mind in, in the third jhana. more sublime than the previous ones, the Buddha says. The fourth jhana. Further great king, Ajatasattu, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain and with the previous passing away of joy and grief, the bhikkhu enters and dwells in the fourth jhana, which is neither present, which is neither pleasant nor painful and contains mindfulness fully purified by equanimity. One sits suffusing one's body with a pure bright mind so that there is no part of one's entire body not suffused with a pure bright mind. So it starts off with the abandoning of pleasure and pain and the passing away of joy and grief. It doesn't mean that the prior jhanas had um, pain or grief. It's just pointing to the neutral aspect of the fourth jhana, which is marked by equanimity. Neither painful nor pleasant. S certainly, the, there was um, pleasure in the first jhana, uh, pleasure in the second, um, and in the third. Um, but this jhana has neither pleasure nor pain. It's just neutral. And it's got, uh, contains mindfulness, purified by equanimity. That really is uh, the mark of the fourth jhana, the equanimity. But if we told students to put their focus on the equanimity of the fourth jhana, it, it, it wouldn't uh, resonate. So we instruct students to put their mind on the quiet stillness of the fourth jhana, and that seems to do the trick. So to get from the third jhana to the fourth jhana, you know, you have to get rid of the pleasure of the third jhana, and contentment has a pleasure to it, the contentment of the third. So you need to let that go and uh, find the neutrality in the mind for the, uh, of equanimity for the fourth jhana. There is even more of a sense of isolation here. You're really quiet and still and, and absorbed into this quiet stillness. And there's a simile the Buddha tells King Ajatasattu, great king, suppose a man were to be sitting covered from head down, from head down, by a white cloth so that there would be no part of his entire body not suffused or not covered by the white cloth. In the same way, great king, the bhikkhu sits suffusing his body with a pure bright mind so that there is no part of his entire body not suffused by a pure bright mind. This too, great king, is a visible fruit here and now of recluseship, of being on this path more excellent and sublime than the previous ones. So there's a, a picture here of um, a pure bright mind in the fourth jhana and um, being covered by a sheet, a white sheet. Uh, and so this is the, speaks to the isolation, the sense of isolation in this jhana. It's uh, really sublime and uh, self-contained. 
we're really getting uh, more subtle. This is uh, the most subtle of, of the, uh, the body jhanas, the first four jhanas, the rupa jhanas, uh, the most subtle. And just a note about this uh, pure bright mind, uh, you'd have to, uh, uh, it requires being in access concentration for about an hour before you can experience pure bright mind. And on retreats, we typically teach access con to be in access concentration for about 10 or 15 minutes. So your uh, experience of the fourth jhana, uh, if you attend a, a retreat with Lee and I might not be this pure bright mind, but if you, had an occasion to sit longer in excess, you would experience it. The uh, monks at the Buddha's uh, in the Buddha's sanghas probably were sitting for a lot longer. But our purpose with teaching the jhanas is uh, to get you in and out of them so that you're left with a concentrated mind with which to investigate reality. And uh, that's why I wanted to speak a bit about this next paragraph, with, which comes right after the fourth jhana, and it's called insight knowledge. When one's mind is thus concentrated, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, wieldy, steady and attained to imperturbability, one directs and inclines that kind of mind to knowledge and vision. One understands thus, this is my body having material form composed of the four primary elements originating from father and mother built up out of rice and gruel, impermanent, subject to rubbing and pressing to dissolution and dispersion. And this is my consciousness supported by the body and bound up with it. This too, great king, is a visible fruit of recluseship, more excellent and sublime than the previous ones. All right. Just skipping the simile there for purposes of uh, time. But um, this is the purpose for doing the jhanas. When the mind is thus concentrated, it you know, by the jhanas, it becomes pure and bright and unblemished, free from the hindrances and defects. It's malleable. You know, it, you can do things with it, the mind. It's wieldy. You can send it to where you want it to go. And it's attained to imperturbability, which means it won't recoil if it sees evil in the mind. It won't recoil if it sees things with dis, that are disgusting in the mind. It will be a neutral observer. It will have less ego in it. And so you're able to see everything in your mind that you might have recoiled at with being perturbed earlier. But now with a concentrated mind, you can see what's in the mind and uh, work with it. It says here, um, with this kind of a mind, you direct and incline it to knowledge and vision. Well, this is the knowing and seeing of insight. So, so according to this roadmap, the Buddha is saying, get your mind concentrated in the jhanas and then incline it to doing your insight work. Uh, into uh, the nature of the mind and body. And, you know, we get really great instructions uh, for insight into the mind and body in the Satipatthana Sutta, the four foundations of mindfulness. Uh, the first one is all about the body. Uh, the, thir the second one is about um, Vedana, which is the mind. The third one is about mind stage, which is the mind. And the fourth one is about uh, the teachings, which a, a lot of that is on the mind. So there's a lot of uh, good insight to be had by uh, inclining the mind at this point after jhanas to your uh, insight practice involving uh, one of the satipatthanas. You get a lot of insight. There's other areas you can investigate as well, including the five daily reflections. You can get a lot of 
good insight uh, into the five daily reflections from a concentrated mind. Because what you're left with after you do the jhanas and you incline it towards investigating reality is a mind that no longer has rose-colored glasses on it of the ego. It's seeing reality without the ego. Now, this concentrated mind won't last forever, you know. I mean, it'll... it'll um, uh, diminish over time, but it'll last long enough to do some good insight work. And what I typically do before I sit down uh, and meditate uh, as I'm getting settled on the cushion, you know, I'll kind of make an intention. If I get my mind concentrated during this sit, and I don't always, but if I do, I'll get it as concentrated as I can. And that can include just access concentration, it doesn't have to be a jhana. And then I'll incline it towards investigating. I'm going to investigate. I want to investigate um, a certain situation going on in my life right now, or and it's really helpful for that. Or I want to investigate um, Vedana and how that how Vedana conditions craving, because that's such an important link in dependent origination. So these are the jhanas. Um, practicing them long term um, can really have the effect of um, moving at one's emotional set point, if you will, from uh, default uh, uh, the mind's default of more negative to uh, the more positive side side of the of the uh, prefrontal cortex. Certainly, when one is in these jhanas. Uh, the positive side of the prefrontal cortex lights up. And long-term, it's said to provide, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, an emotional reset over to that side. All right, so that's my talk on the jhanas. What questions might you have? And it would help if you raised your digital hand. Hopefully everyone knows how to do that. It's on because I, there's more than one screen and I can't canvas for hands raised. So if you could go down to the reactions button and uh, raise uh, your hand there, it's a digital flesh colored hand, um, that'll get you in the queue and then I can uh, call on you in the order in which uh, you raise your hands. And Misha, it's so nice, let's see. Oh, Chris, no, Misha, yeah, great. It's so nice to see you this morning. I'm glad you could join us. Yeah, thanks. You too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I I read the the summary in the discourse, and it was not the same as hearing you describe it because I think I was in at least the first jhana, possibly the second, maybe even the third. Mm -hmm. Years ago, I went through a Kundalini awakening process over a few months period, and I mean, it just sounds like you're describing. Mm -hmm. Experience mm -hmm. some, of, some of the, that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just kind of right now just blown away by hearing that because mm -hmm. this is one of the things is like I have these experiences and where do I go to find out what it is and if there's something to be done or to proceed mm -hmm. from that. And I also, um, so at some point I want to ask somebody, maybe you talk more about it when I'm not in this emotional state right, right and um and also i very much appreciate your speaking to the purpose of doing the jhanas because i thought to myself why would i chase after these pleasurable states in and of themselves well i wouldn't for themselves but if this is what can help shift the set point that's the reason why i'd like to cultivate these yeah, thank you, Misha. Yeah, that's a really good reason. And the another good reason is just because doing an doing insight practice, investigating reality with little or no ego is a game changer. Exactly, especially because right now what's coming up is this thing I've called the dread monster for a long time, and it's drive this anxiety that is been life dominating 
Um, and so to be able to, and I'm determined to investigate this now, this is a major point of investigation. So to be able to do that when I'm engaging with a part that's, um, that has the qualities of reveling in destroying and inflicting pain and suffering, you know, the thing I most have wanted to not have any part of. Mm. So I think uh, cultivating the jaundice might, uh, if not be essential, at least be an important way to help me do that yeah. inquiry process. That's, that sounds really smart, Misha. And if um, if you find yourself on a retreat where the jhanas are being taught, I would encourage you to to ask the teacher about using metta as your method of uh, getting into access concentration in the jhanas. I think uh, for what you're going to be doing. Uh, Meta, especially self meta, would be an excellent method. So, Kathleen. Now, can you hear me? I can. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, I just love the opportunity to ask this question because it's been in my life stream for so many years. Um, when I was a teenager at a, at a camp, I was laying out on a dock and I just allowed myself to just be. And I looked up at the clouds and I looked at them and nothing was around me. And I suddenly had this incredible rush that came over me. And I felt that I was absolutely, I wasn't even I anymore. There was no me there. It was just presence with the universe. And I wonder if that was unwittingly a jhana experience. Yeah, was there um, was there happiness associated? Oh, it was joy. It was absolutely joyous. Yeah, it was so wonderful. I started weeping. Yeah, just like the memory is uh, is having the. Uh, an it effect. is. I'm re I'm reliving it, and it was that good. good. Yeah, just like. So me. I mean, it's obviously not connected at all with bo bo uh, meditation practice or anything, but it right. still was an experience, and I'm just very yeah. curious yeah it's one you never forget I totally get that yeah I mean I I get told that a lot by students you know um and I had the you know I went to my teacher at the time Lee and said the same thing you know I had this experience it was incredible what and um yeah it sounds like it, it could have been you know um it's it's otherworldly not not like anything uh, you've experienced uh, and because the ego is gone. Yeah. And that's what makes it so uh, special. The, the really nice thing about having a sense of confirmation of it is, uh, without taking anyone else's time anymore than just finishing this thought, is that it gives me a sense of access. Yeah. If I experienced it then, if, I'm, if I really let go and I'm in present, it seems like something that I may be able to experience again, which would be wonderful. <laughs> Very good, Kathleen. Uh, I hope you get that opportunity. You mentioned something letting go. I, I just wanted to uh, mention that these jhanas are a great teacher of letting go because with, with each one, you have to let go a little bit more. In, in the fourth jhana, you have to let go of almost everything to experience it. And, you know, letting go is... Um, what this path is all about, renunciation, letting go into Nibbana. And so it's a great teacher in exercising the letting go muscle, uh, which really comes in handy if you're faced with an opportunity uh, to let go into Nibbana, you know, you, you can do it without uh, any resistance. Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> Carl. Harry, I'm I'm curious um, how how would you um, what would you recommend? to students, to sincere practitioners whose life circumstances don't easily support going, going deep like this. I, one of the amazing things about your descriptions is that 
it, it opens up, besides confirming people's experiences that they may not have been able to name before, like we're hearing now, it, it, it really opens up senses of possibility about where this path can take us. You know, it's not just some sort of uh, incremental betterment. You know, it's something completely different. But uh, how does that, how do you keep students who are, you know, you know, paying the bills, as they say, and, uh, you know, whose life circumstances may not easily support what you're describing, you know, how to, how to play that, that situation? Well, first, I would recommend getting Lee Brasington's book. It's called Right Concentration, R-I-G-H-T, Concentration, by Lee Brasington, L-E-I-G-H, Brasington, with B like boy. Um, it's, it sets out how to get in the jhanas. Uh, it sets out just what we, I just did, and plus there's more instruction, just like we instruct on a retreat. In fact, his book was taken from his talks given at a retreat. That's one thing. Now, to try to get into the jhanas at home or to get back in the jhanas at home after go having gotten into them on retreat is difficult. You need us the support of a retreat without distraction. You need the momentum of mindfulness. And you need to be have the, the surroundings where you can optimally let go of the hindrances without getting fed more as you do at home every day. So um, I really recommend retreat. Now, having said that, um, you know, during the pandemic, and we're still in it, so I shouldn't say it is a past tense, really and I were scheduled to teach one on Zoom, a, a jhana retreat on Zoom. And we wound up having to get it canceled because Lee got sick. But we may do one again like that. Who knows? I don't know. But it's harder to get in the jhanas at home for the reasons I said. Yeah. And uh, seven days is, you know, ideally a month retreat would be great. Uh, two weeks is is the next best thing. Ten days is the next best thing. Uh, Lee and I don't teach retreats any shorter than 10 days. Uh, I, ha I have taught a 10-day jhana retreat for the IMCW community in Washington, D.C., and we'll do so again in the, probably next year. So you can look for that. Yeah. Well, I, well, I still have the open mic. I just want to ask one more question. Um, at one point, I can remember when we were together, but you mentioned how getting into the jhanas uh, is, uh, is help, uh, helps transition from doubt or, or helps remove doubt. And I was, if you wouldn't mind speaking to that a little bit. Well, and yeah. Great. Thank you. Sure, Carl. Thank you. There is something. Um, inspiring about finding these rooms in your mind that gives you energy for the practice. It's very inspiring. And um, confidence building in the teachings, because now all of a sudden you're experiencing something you've read that was written over 2,500 years ago. So it can help alleviate doubt. But most importantly, you gain insight from a, the, a less of an egocentric place into into your mind and body, most, you know, into their impermanent nature, their dependent nature, their not self nature, their dukkha nature. <laughs> um, and these kinds of insights 
give you greater and greater wisdom. And that's what you need for awakening experience. So it's got great potential. Not everybody can get into the jhanas, but um, I encourage you to go on retreat. Uh, it's a high percentage. So I want to leave, oh, there's one more hand. Uh, now there's two, Emily and then Joe. Uh, I think I just wanted, I was muted. I just okay. wanted to say um, how inspiring your energy is when you speak of this. It's um, so I have this very strong yoga background and um, well, I can't imagine a 10 day retreat without doing yoga. So uh, you can do yoga on a jhana retreat. There's there's breaks in the day. I do yoga on retreats every day. Oh, good, good because that is the way that I find that um, peace in my body, the quiet. Yes, and it also helps you get into the body, so you can saturate, suffuse, and steep yourself with these ex these experiences of the jhanas. Now, yeah. I wouldn't recommend more than a half hour, you know, a day or, or, or for, I mean, I don't know how long you, you practice yoga. Huh? I'm, I'm old enough not to do a lot more. Than yeah. That. Yeah. Half hour, 45 minutes would be, yeah. I do it every day. I'm on retreat. Right. Yeah. I just wondered if it was, if it was contrary to, to mm -hmm. learning about the jhanas, because certainly a lot of yoga is focused on bringing yourself into these states of embodiment. Exactly. No, I think it's, uh, it's very complimentary. Thank you. You're welcome, Emily. Jo? Um, Mary, uh, I just wanted to tell you that um, I am just suffused, mm -hmm. suffused with gratitude for your teachings this morning. It's such a pleasure and such deep meaning to me to hear from your perspective these deep teachings. And I have had a number of experiences that you just described. I've been meditating for over 20 years and, um, and for a concentrated period of time, I focused as my primary practice on metta. And I find it so interesting that you mentioned that as a vehicle for approaching this kind of deep concentration. And I, uh, I've tried to describe my experiences to other people from time to time, hoping I would have a glimmer of deeper understanding of what they are. And, um, I'm so thrilled because you've just shed light. You've just illuminated this for me and for all of us. Uh, um, and I did note after uh, experiencing these in my own way previously that many things began to roll into place such as greater equanimity. And it's, you know, Carl, you spoke of how they build on one another and how it's not like we check things off. But I had noted in these years of practice that the more and more we endeavor with a ardency, you know, to practice, that more and more of the desired results on the path began to emerge. And uh, so now I, I'm really... I'm really understanding for the first time that these windows and doors can open further for me. And I'm sure we're all so grateful to you for this experience. Uh, after I get off this call, I'm just going to cry. <laughs> and Carl, thank you for inviting Mary. <laughs> well, thank you, Joe, so much. That was so sweet. Yeah, great way to, to, to wind up.
um, I'm going to give Carl, Carl asked for the last five minutes. So I'm just going to spend the next minute or so. If you'll just come into your bodies, um, finding your butt in the chair or on the cushion, you know, your legs, however they're configured and, and your arms and the hands, however they're configured. And just notice your body breathing, you know, it just breathes itself. It's just amazing. And then what I'll encourage you to do, um, I'm going to invite you to do something on the in-breath and something on the out-breath. And we won't have many in and out-breaths to do this with. But, you know, when you catch an in-breath, see if you can uh, breathe in the word um, peace so that it is a, has a calming effect on your inner being. Just breathing in the word peace. And then on the out breath, when you can catch one, you can continue to breathe in the word peace on the in breath, but just add on, on an out breath or two or three, the word love, breathing out love. And this love is not going outward too far. In fact, it's just for you. Imagine on the out breath, you're breathing out love such that you're um, completely surrounded like by a blanket of love so that you're breathing in peace on the in-breath and breathing out love that is surrounding you on the out-breath. Namaste, everyone. May we all be free from suffering. Carl, I will turn it over to you. So Mary, I'm so glad uh, you were able to join us. Um, and, uh, you know, just one thing to point out about the, what, what the teaching points to. Um, this is the first section of this teaching where it says, and this is more excellent and sublime than the previous ones. And I think what's important to note about that is that the getting into the jhanas constitutes a real turning point in practice. Um, and you know what I what I hope that uh, this session of ours has done is to. Uh, open up doors that we didn't, you know, we may not have realized that they were there before, but, uh, you know, there's a sense of possibility perhaps that, uh, you know, about what practice can do for us, what it is, where it can take us. And uh, Mary, you did such a wonderful job of describing from your own experience what, this teaching is about. 